Dr. Anthony Chafee, welcome to the one and only Meat Mafia podcast. We're excited to have you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. It's good to see you guys. Yeah, we were uh, we were pumped that we finally got to meet you at KetoCon as well. So we're going from in person to virtual. We tried to do something in person, but hopefully uh, we'll have to take a trip out to Australia next time to do a live session. I guess. Yeah, yeah that'd be awesome. Um, no, but we're we're really excited to have you on. I mean, I know that um, we think that this is going to be a great episode. We know that for you, MD by trade, neurosurgeon, high level athlete, you're an all American rugby player. You've done a ton of amazing research. And also just putting out content, explaining why humans biologically were meant to be carnivores. We know you followed a carnivore diet for the better part of 10 years, and our audience is going to gain a ton of value from this episode. So I think it's a starting point, man. We'd love to just learn a little bit more about your background and how you started to kind of like nutritionally dive down this rabbit hole. Yeah, well, thanks. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully people do find it useful. And uh, I mean, that's the whole whole idea. Um yeah, so, you know, I, I'm obviously young, I'm from America, but I, I've lived all over the world. I, I played sports, you know, all my life. I uh, got very lucky in that, you know, the number one MMA gym in the world, uh, arguably, is was a few miles from my house, AMC Kickboxing in Kirkland. My trainer, Matt Hume, was, you know, one of the top ranked fighters of, of all time, really, and one of the top trainers of all time. And, uh, and just just a really nice guy. And he was my, my coach there and my wrestling coach as well. Um, so I had a lot of uh, very good influence on, on an athletic background. He was a very, very you know strict person in his uh, athletic endeavors and his training, but also in his diet. And you know he did not drink. He ate very clean, and he, you know, was uh, was very regimented in that. And and it wasn't hard. You know, he just he just liked performing optimally and and being the best that he could. And and that was the the way to do it. And so I really admired that. And then I got into rugby after that and and ended up uh, uh, you know stopped um, doing MMA. I, I you know I only like trained. I was I was waiting till I turned eighteen so I could actually you know start fighting. But uh, you know I never actually competed in that. But then I got into rugby. And as you say, I was I was an all American. Uh, in my second year, and uh, and then continued on to play professional rugby after that in uh, the U.S., uh, Canada, and England. So nutrition was always very important for me, and because I was always interested in the biological sciences and just science in general, that was something that that really spoke to me. So I liked taking biology class. I liked taking uh, you know botany and cancer biology and nutritional courses because of my interest in medicine, but also my interest in, in athletics. And I wanted to be able to feed my body, you know, exactly what it needed to, to, you know, kick ass. And when I was uh, taking cancer biology at the university of Washington in Seattle, I, you know, I was taught that, you know, plants are living organisms and they like to stay living organisms. And so they have defenses just like any other living uh, creature. Animals can run away or fight back, for instance, and plants can't, they're stationary. And so they have to use other modalities. One of those modalities is using defense chemicals and, and actually just being toxic. Um, you know, we know this in, intuitively by the fact that if you get lost in the woods and you run out of food, you can't just eat any random plant. You know, most of them will make you very, very sick or even kill you. We were looking at this from a cancer perspective. And we were actually studying the amount of carcinogens that were just in normal vegetables that we would eat on a daily basis. And you know, we learned that, and this is, this is 22 years ago, mind you. So we've actually discovered much more since then. But at the time we discovered, or we were you know, taught that Brussels sprouts had 136 already identified human carcinogens, that mushrooms had over hundred, spinach, kale, lettuce, celery, cabbage, cucumber, broccoli, you name it. These things were had over 60 or 80 known human carcinogens each and they're quite abundant you know there's research going back uh, to 1989 with professor bruce ames from uc berkeley showing that the natural pesticides and insecticides and actual then the natural defense chemicals in plants outweighed the pesticides we sprayed on these things industrially by a factor of 10,000, and that the naturally occurring poisons were orders of magnitude times more likely to cause cancer than the pesticides we sprayed on them, which is why we still have pesticides. We're actually looking to ban them until this research came out and just basically showed that this was a drop in the bucket. So we were, we were quite taken aback by this. And I remember thinking in my head, I'm like, but, you know, but vegetables are still good for you though, right? And, you know, he just looked at us and must have just, you know, uh, realized what we were thinking. And he just said, you know, I don't eat salad. I don't eat vegetables. I don't let my kids eat vegetables plants are trying to kill you so 
But I was like, right, screw plants. And I just stopped eating them. And, you know, I, I defaulted into a carnivore diet just because I wasn't going to eat any plants. And so, you know, it's just like, I, I was just started eating eggs and meat and that was it because that, that those did not have plants. Um, and I felt amazing. I, I never felt better. And I didn't realize it was, you know, that doing it at the time. I also stopped drinking at that time during the rugby season. And obviously that was a huge uh, boost to my, uh, to my, my athleticism and my recovery. And so I chalked up most of that to the, to the drinking side of things, but, you know, years later, I sort of looked back and, and discovered more information. You'll see, obviously, you know, Dr. Sean Baker's uh, work and his interview on Joe Rogan uh, you know, five years ago um, that, you know, humans really are carnivores. That's just the kind of animal that we are. And I, I look back, I'm like, oh, that's what, I, that's what it was. That was the difference. And when I sort of slipped off of that. I noticed within a few months, I was like, you know, why, do, why don't I feel as just unbelievably amazing as I normally do? And I, I didn't really know what it was. I was like, am I just not pushing myself as hard? Am I just, you know, I'm 25 now? Am I just over the hump and I'm just dying now? <laughs> and like, um, I, I honestly thought that I was like, well, maybe that's it. Um, but of course that's nonsense. You know, it was, it was because I slipped off the diet and I started incorporating some plant foods back in, you know, even just like breaded chicken, you know, and that was enough to screw me up. And, and since realizing that I've just gone absolutely strict, uh, carnivore, just meat and water. Um, and, uh, you know, very rarely I'll have a bit of dairy, but it was almost, it's almost never. And it's only used as a condiment. I wouldn't just like eat just dairy on its own. And I, and since then I've just, I've had the exact same results and, and benefits that I noticed in my early twenties when I was playing professional rugby, I felt like a superhero. I couldn't get tired. I couldn't get, um, sore i couldn't you know i couldn't run out of energy i could just go 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 and my body just just you know performed and responded uh you know, better than at any point in uh, in my life when i wasn't eating like this and so since then I've, I've really dug into the research and 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 started asking questions and checking in the literature because if you have you know if you have competing theories you know you should be able to find evidence with which to test them again so i've just asked questions and sort of diving into the literature and see what we know see what we can prove and see you know what what uh, is left to be um, understood and you know that's solidified um, my understanding of the subject and and convinced me that you know we really are carnivores as a species biologically which is what all the best evidence shows mm -hmm. and that not only that but that if we apply this in medicine, we can actually reverse so many diseases that we that we uh, you know think are chronic issues that aren't chronic issues. I, I argue that they're actually toxicities. You know, we are getting poisoned by these defense chemicals, and we are getting the manifestations of those of those poisonings. But we call them disease. We call them diabetes. We call it heart disease. We call it cancer, autoimmune diseases. Um, they're not. They're they're toxicities and malnutrition, and you can you can see this evidence of this by the fact that when you remove this influence and just put people on a meat and water diet, these issues go away, mm. you know, and I'm, I'm not just, and I'm not, you know, saying that sometimes they go away. I've not seen them not go away. And there was that large Harvard study with over 2000 patients and like every single person improved by significant objective markers, you know, and a lot of people, if not most people, recovered completely. Now there's such a thing as damage done and you can, you can permanently harm yourself, but you will get rid of the active poisoning and you will stop getting worse. You will certainly improve a lot. And that, so that's what I try to incorporate into my practice now as a doctor. Mm. Is there a case to be made for having like trace amounts of these toxicities in your body to help you like build up some sort of defense? Or are you just of the belief that full removal, like just don't even, don't even eat them at all? Yeah, I mean, maybe, but, you know, I, I think the people that argue for the hormesis side of things, you know, should really, really need to, uh, you know, provide some evidence on, you know, does it provide benefit, which chemicals provide benefit, what dosages do they provide benefit? Right. And, uh, you know, because it's going to be, it's going to be a, a real tight margin. And, um, you know, plants have thousands if not tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of different chemicals in them, you know, you want you and one of these things acts hormetically at dose X and maybe two leaves of, uh, of a tomato plant provides dose X for that chemical. Well, what about the other 10,000 chemicals that are screwing with you? Are those all also hormetic? Are they in the right dosages? Or are they too much? Are they too little? So, you know, it's, it's, 
I think is a bit more complicated than the, oh, it's probably, it's probably hormetic. There's probably hormesis. Okay, maybe, but the burden of proof is on, on the people advocating for that. And I have yet to see any hard evidence that is beneficial at all whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Dr. Chafee, what kind of evidence did you come across in your research in your 20s that made you think, damn, humans really are evolutionarily meant to be carnivores that was so compelling to you? Um, well, you know, it, it's mostly uh, the anthropological data and the, the fossil record. You know, so there's, uh, you know, the, the stable isotope studies are you know, very, very interesting. You know, this looks at, you know, certain isotopes that, that remain stable over time. And you can, you can actually look at the bones and see, you know, uh, you know, how much of this is in or in these bones. And if you have a buildup of these, then you, you'll actually see, you can actually track that up the food chain, right? So if you have, you know, just like, you know, like heavy metals and, and fish, right? You have like the lower level fish, they're getting a bit of uh, mercury or whatever. And then another fish eats that, another fish eats that fish, another fish, fish eats that fish, and then like a shark eats that. And so they have a, like, they'll have higher concentration of these heavy metals as you go up. So you, you can do the same sort of thing with these stable isotopes. And can actually tell uh, where on the food chain these animals are, and our ancestors, um, you know, for the last you know two million plus years, uh, have been pure carnivores and have have had a higher carnivore rating than even other carnivores live at the same time, like lions, hyenas, foxes, wolves, because we were eating the lions, hyenas, foxes, foxes, and wolves. So we were again top of the food chain. This is this is something that that we. You know, we've been taught since since I was a kid anyway that you know we we're apex predators top of the food chain. How many apex predators do you know that eat a plant based diet? I mean it's it's you know it, it's you know it, it's contrary it's it's counterintuitive. It's like you know you're top of the food chain. That means you eat animals. Mm -hmm. I mean you eat all the animals. And so you know I've, I've never seen a shark you know eat kelp for roughage. You know and uh, and lions don't eat grass. So. Uh, we're not supposed to be eating these things either. Other side of it is, you know, anthropologically, you have all these different different populations, like the Native Americans, um, you know, in North America and, and the far northern reaches, such as you know the Inuit uh, populations. These people were exclusively carnivores, mm -hmm. and they actually lived to be great ages. And you know, by their own uh, accounts, but uh, you know, why why would we believe our accounts over over their accounts? You know, I mean, there's people saying this is when I was born. Um, the Australian Aboriginals as well, uh, you know, even even people in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are records of the of these guys living very great ages. And people say, oh, no, no, the, the, all these people died in their 30s. I'm like, well, that's nonsense. You know, average life expectancy from birth, maybe, because three out of five kids died in infancy, that's going to pull down that average a little bit. But, you know, like the Zulu uh, nation in, in the 1800s, for instance, they had a law that you couldn't even get married and have kids until you were 35. If everyone died at 30, that's not really working, is it? You yeah. know, so, you no, know, life started, family started in their 30s. OK, so so that's um, that's a representation of of, uh, of average life expectancy from birth, not actual actually how long do people live. So there are tons of these sorts of records. Um and they all ate meat. They all exclusively ate meat. And when the European explorers came around to the Americas, came around to Australia, they studied them. And I've, I've written many accounts. And they were saying they, they only eat meat. They were very surprised by this. They were like, why, you know, why don't they, they eat all these other things? Try and give them bread. Try and give them other things. They're like, no, absolutely not. Get that away from me. They knew which plants they could eat if they needed to, if they uh, were starving or if they needed to use something medicinally. And so people say, oh, they would use these teas and they'd eat these things, they do these other things. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. When would they do it? How often would they do it? Mm -hmm. They would do it when they had to, when there was need. And all the accounts that I've ever read of these early explorers and the missionaries that went to Australia and, and, Native, and um, North America, you know, they all said that these guys just ate meat. That's it. And, you know, when they had to, they, they knew which plants they could survive on. But as soon as they got meat again, bang, that was it. And so, you know, they didn't get these diseases of the West, as they called it. It's these diseases that only really showed up in European populations and the explorers populations. And they come in like, wow, these guys aren't really getting these problems. They're not getting gout. They're not getting obesity. They're not getting all these, these different problems. And, you know, now they're getting them you know, at, at many times the rate that Europeans are. And that's because it's not a disease. It's not diseases of the West. It's that, you know, we were eating plant-based foods uh, 
as well as meat. And we were getting the toxicities uh, that we got from that because Native Americans and Aboriginals in Australia and other populations, the Sub-Saharan African populations, uh, you know, like the Black population in America, because they don't, they, they didn't come across plant-based nutrition and agriculture as early as, you know, say, you know, Caucasian uh, ethnicities, they, they don't have as many resistances built up to these plant toxins. And so they get more sick quicker. Mm. You know, I, I think that this is the reason why, you know, African-American populations have higher rates of metabolic disease and blood pressure and refractory, uh, you know, to medications. Um, it's certainly the case in the Australian Aboriginals and certainly the case in the Native American populations. Mm. And so, you know, I, I remember learning as a kid that, you know, when Native Americans were eating a Western diet, they were four times as likely to get obesity, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and all the rest. And I remember thinking, well, doesn't that mean that the food is causing the disease? You know, because if they don't eat the food, they don't get the disease. You know, and we eat the food and we get the disease just at a lower rate. You know, and, and what's a non-Western diet? What are they eating that we're not and vice versa? You know, they, they didn't tell me at the time, but, you know, it was, it was a pure high fat carnivore diet. And so, there are, and, and there's tons of other things too, you know, since you look at it, you know, anatomically, biologically, you know, just how our body processes plants and fiber. We can't, we cannot break down fiber. We used to be able to, we used to have a long elongated cecum. Now it's an appendix. That's because we haven't used it in millions of years, but back in the day, millions of years ago, it was much longer. And that was what fiber would pack in and break down into short chain fatty acids. We can't do that anymore. You know, it's very simple. If your body cannot break down fiber, you shouldn't be eating fiber. You know, you're not designed to eat fiber. You don't get nutrition from it. All animals that eat uh, fibrous plants can break down and are supposed to biologically adapted to can break down fiber for nutrition to some degree, you know, some more than others, but they all can do it. So we cannot do that. That's because we, we have not done that in millions and millions of years. And, uh, and there's ton, tons of other things that we could go into if you're interested yeah, I, I'd be curious because the fiber topic is one that clearly gets brought up a bunch for, you know, anyone who's gone carnivore and, and takes the criticisms from family members or whatever. It's like, don't you need fiber? What about your cholesterol? Mm -hmm. What sort of things do you do you typically hear about from either like your family and friends or just like people who are trying to adopt a carnivore diet and just like hearing all the feedback from friends and family? Yeah, you know, fi fiber and cholesterol are two of the big ones, you know, like, well, what about fiber? How are you going to, you know, take a dump? Well, I don't know. How does a lion do it? You know, how does a dolphin do it? How do 66% of all species of animal do it, right? 66% of, of, of animals are carnivores, right? So, you know, how are they doing it? So fiber does not drive your digestion fiber actually screws with your digestion so it's not that you not even that you don't need fiber it's that you don't want fiber it causes harm and so it can actually cause microabrasion in your gut lining increased mucus secretion increased inflammatory response it really does a number on people with you know inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, as I'm, you know, I, well, maybe you correct me you know, if I'm wrong, but, uh, you know, you have experience with that as well. But from what everyone's told me that that absolutely just plays merry hell with their digestion. And, um, you know, not only that, but like, I mean, there have actually been, you know, uh, studies on top of that showing that, that colon disease, such as diverticulosis, that this is uh, the only things that are even associated, but have a strong association with diverticulosis are increased amount of fiber intake and increased number of, of bowel motions, you know, so you're, you're overworking this organ, you're using it too much and it, and it finally fails. So fiber, fiber actually causes harm Like you really shouldn't mm. be eating it all. It also blocks the absorption of other nutrients. And so it, it causes physical tangles and a physical barrier between the enzymes and the food and then the broken down food and your gut lining uh, for it to absorb in. So you actually don't absorb all the nutrients that, that you're supposed to. So that that's actually hurting you as well. And then maybe say like, Oh, this is really good because you can eat, you can eat even more, but you're not actually absorbing it. So you won't get fat. I mean, like where in nature is it an advantage to not absorb nutrients? You know, generally when you're not absorbing nutrients in the wild, you, you die very shortly afterwards. Mm -hmm. So you know, that, that doesn't make sense from an evolutionary standpoint either. Uh, the cholesterol thing, you know, is, is a big topic, but very, very simply, uh, it's all garbage. You know, like the idea that, that cholesterol caused heart disease is nonsense. That was, that has been completely and thoroughly debunked 
in the peer-reviewed medical literature going back to 2015. Uh, 2015, the Journal of the American Medical Association, one of the top medical journals in the world, published a paper uh, from the University of California, San Francisco uh, Medical School, detail, showing that there was like actual internal memos from the sugar companies detailing back in like this, you know, the 60s that, you know, they were paying off various professors, you know, from Harvard and elsewhere to falsify data and publish fraudulent studies to make it appear as a cholesterol caused heart disease when in fact it was sugar. And now we have actually very strong biochemical evidence, mm -hmm. you know, from UCSF showing that fructose, you know, which is the sweet part of sugar, it's in honey, it's in fruit, it's in, you know, table sugar, that this has actually broken down in the same byproducts as, as alcohol. And this causes a lot of the same problems as alcohol consumption, including heart disease. And so they had to sort of get a scapegoat and, and, and vilify something else. And they, and they picked cholesterol and uh, it's nonsense. We have, we have hard evidence that it's nonsense. And we have hard evidence that these people were paid off. We even know how much they were paid off. $6,500 is about the equivalent of like 50 grand now. Like that's what their souls were worth. And, um, you know, and one of these guys was named, you know, head of the USDA, and he, he was the one who authored and published the 1977 USDA declaration that cholesterol caused heart disease and everyone should stop. You know, and then you had the Framingham study, which I was taught in medical school, showed that higher cholesterol equaled higher heart disease. Wrong. Mm -hmm. Read the actual study. It concluded, it, it showed the opposite. Its results actually showed the opposite of that. The American Heart Association, two years later, misreported the Framingham study and claimed that it, higher cholesterol went, went along with higher heart disease rates. It's nonsense. It's complete garbage. You know, I, I and it's, and it's demonstrable is a matter of record. So, you know, and, and people say that, Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I get it. You know, fat's not bad. Fat's good for me. Cholesterol is good for me. Oh, but look at my LDL. I'm like, what did we just say? You know, cholesterol was never the problem. So why are you looking at your LDL? It doesn't matter. You yeah. know, and all the big studies actually show that that higher LDL cholesterol is actually associated with longer lifespan, less disease, longer, um, you know, independence and free from nursing home as, as we age. So it's actually, it's actually very good for you. You know, as, as uh, Dr. Ken Berry says, uh, HDL is the good cholesterol and LDL is the other good cholesterol. They're both good for you, but you need both of them. Yeah. The demon is the demonization of red meat is really a shame because I know for myself, like we were just talking about this before we hit record when I, when I'm as strict, just red meat, salt, water, maybe some bone broth. That's when my stomach is by far the best. Like when I was flared up with UC, when I was 21, I was already going to the bathroom like 20 to 30 times a day. I couldn't keep anything down. And then within two weeks of doing carnivore, I was like down to going to the bathroom twice a day, which is literally unheard of. Yeah. You know, when I would bring my steak into the office and my first corporate job, people would, people were like 50 pounds overweight telling me that I'm going to kill myself. So <laughs> it's just, it's funny, but it's, it's honestly a shame though, because yeah. there's probably so many people that could be curing these incurable autoimmune conditions or diseases by incorporating this approach that you're talking about. I'm sure it's something mm. you spend a ton of time thinking about. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. And, you know, this is something that, you know, we see in practice now, a lot, a lot of the stuff is, is still anecdotal, but, you know, I, I there there absolutely is enough data and, and literature to put all these pieces together and, and start using this as a treatment modality. And, and, and this is what I've done. And so I've, I've done this and I've encouraged other doctors to do this. And, and there's certainly a bunch of other people, other doctors that already have already been doing this or have been, you know, gaining on, you know, you know w without my influence, uh, which is great. And what we are seeing is that these people are, just, com just, just completely revolutionizing their health, reversing these so-called chronic diseases, which again, I don't think are chronic diseases. I think these are toxicities, you know, and, uh, and also malnutrition. And, and so this is, this is what we're seeing where we are actually seeing people reverse diabetes come off their, uh, you know, insulin medications come off their insulin pump, um, certainly reversing autoimmune diseases. I have yet to see an autoimmune issue that has not just, just disappeared in the face of a carnivore diet, you know, multiple sclerosis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's ulcerative colitis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, um, you know, I, everything I, I have yet to see one. I'm, I'm sure there probably is something out there that, that, that maybe won't respond as well to a carnivore diet. I have yet to see it, you mm -hmm. know? So, you know, it is, and, and, you know, as, as you know, you know, 
uh, UC and Crohn's, these, these are devastating, uh, uh, debilitating issues. Okay. And, uh, and, and, they, and they line you up for, for serious issues. You know, like UC, most people with UC, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna be running into uh, you know, a total colectomy and having their entire large intestine removed generally in their 20s because it's almost invariably going to give these people uh, cancer if, it, if it's not controlled and it's almost never controlled. And so that's something that, that, that we were taught in medical school that you know, if someone has UC, that it's basically, it's, it's a matter of, they're definitely going to have to have a total colectomy and, you know, when to time it, you know, and, um, you know, but that, that's not something that's necessary, you know. And I think something I've heard you speak about this before, like the efficacy of these primary red meat diets, this isn't something new. I think you pointed to mm. Dr. Jay Salisbury's work from mm. like the 1800s talking about red meat diets, healing Crohn's colitis, IBS. Is that correct? Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, so so that's the thing. There's a ton of literature that we've just papered over and forgotten because mm -hmm. of the weight of the uh, propaganda that cholesterol and meat are bad. Mm -hmm. And so you know, Dr. J. H. Salisbury, who who's eponymous for the the Salisbury steak. I always thought that was like a like a place name, you know, like Salisbury, England. Yeah. Uh, but no, it was named after Dr. J. H. Salisbury, who was a New York doctor in the 1800s. He did a 30 year research project into the optimal diet for humans, and he wrote a book called you know the relation between alimentation and disease, basically the relationship between what we eat and the diseases we get. And he argued exactly what I'm arguing now, that these diseases are not diseases, that this comes from the food that we eat. And so he found that he could cure people by putting them on a pure red meat and water diet that people, and this is long before sugar, you know, was, was, was even on the radar, you know, had no refined sugar at the time, you know, fruit was seasonal at best. And people were already, you know, well aware that meat was, was very important. But we had other things as well. And it was the other, the, just these normal vegetables and grains that were causing these problems without sugar in the, in the mix. So, you know, he found that people that were eating, you know, plants, including uh, as well as meat, uh, that they were getting diseases that other people simply weren't. They were, they were more, they were, their immune system was crap. They were more susceptible to tuberculosis, which was a major killer at the time in America. Um, they were in Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, gout, all these things, you know, chronic Lyme disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, all these, all these various problems. And he found that he could cure them by putting them on a pure red meat and water diet. And that's where the Salisbury steak was. The Salisbury steak was a, was a special way of grinding, uh, you know, beef so that it got, it sort of filtered out the uh, connective tissue, like the, the hard sort of gristle. And he found that, that people with like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, uh, had, a, had a much better time with this because, you know, it was completely untreated. I mean, this is a hundred years before any, any real treatment for Crohn's, Crohn's or UC. And so these people were just in desperate, desperate straits. And he, you know, and they, they really didn't want to have anything going through. So if you, if you just, you know, filter out the, the uh, gristle, you'll absorb 100% of, of the meat that you eat you know, the muscle meat and the fat will just absorb, you will absorb all of that. And so you'll have literally no waste. You'll have very little waste. Otherwise you'll still absorb like 98% of the meat you're eating. You know, so only a little bit will go out, but you know, these people that are in horrible, horrible pain, uh, you know, they really need just nothing coming through there. And so that's why he had the, the Salisbury steak. And yeah, he found that to be the case. This was actually very popular. You know, people call it like the first fad diet. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you can call something a fad if it's if it's actually biologically appropriate. You know, um, you know, I guess fad just has to do with with popularity and and the transient nature of of that. But uh, it is our our biologically appropriate diet, and many people took up his uh, mantle after that and, and wrote books and papers, you know, there's uh, multiple, you know, Stefanson from Harvard. He was a professor of ethnology there in Polar Explorer. He lived with the, you know, the Eskimos Inuit and, and he showed that like, this is how they eat. They just eat meat. And they're, and I, and I've, I've eaten, been eating with them and I've never felt better in my entire life. And, you know, they ran experiments where they only ate meat for an entire year under supervised care at Bellevue hospital in, in New York. And uh, I found like, wow, yeah, no, these guys are, are super healthy and they're not lying. They're only eating meat. So, 
and there's just so many more. I mean, so many books, so many papers, you know, I was looking at the journal of American medical association, even back in the fifties. And there's so many papers being published, just arguing that, you know, uh, the, that the, the push to say that cholesterol caused heart disease was nonsense. You know, they said like, you know, people are pretty much accepting that cholesterol, um, you know, causes heart disease, but this is based on really bad evidence and really bad science. And just went through excoriating all the different papers that try to suggest this. So this, this was a heated battle and there was a lot going on. And like, even, even as, as recently as 1975, there was a, a book, I forget the guy's name, but he was a, he was a doctor, he's a gastroenterologist. And he wrote a book called the stone age or oh, sorry, the stone age diet. And, you know, he argued again that humans are carnivores. That's just what we are. He's like, here's the evidence of that. And, you know, medically said like, oh, this is, this is how we should be eating. You know, and that, you know, me as a gastroenterologist, basically, I don't need to exist as a profession if you don't eat plants, wow. you know, and then in 1977, you know, cholesterol became, became evil and everything just got shoved out the door because teachers said so. That was it. Discussion over. And it, it just, it just, uh, you know, ruined and discredited all the people, all the doctors and researchers who you know, we're thrashing these, these paid shills from Harvard uh, in debate and open live debate. And it's just absolutely destroying them. Uh, but because teacher said so, because the USDA said so officially, well, that's it. No well, decisions down. That's what it is. Can't be anything different, mm -hmm. you know, and that, and that absolutely just, just destroyed the health of humanity. I mean, I, I'm not saying that lightly, you know, the obesity rate tripled, heart disease tripled, stroke rate tripled, cancer rates tripled, Type 2 diabetes increased by a factor of six, autoimmune diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and even neurodevelopmental delays such as autism all increased exponentially. They almost didn't exist before then. Now they're the only things we treat. And they all increased at the exact same time, you know? So explain that one. You yeah. know, like something happened. You know, our genetics didn't happen. Anyone who studies population genetics know that can't happen in that short of a time. And so something happened in our environment, you know? And that was a major, major change at that time. And you know, it seems to coincide with this major uptick in disease. And funny enough, when you reverse those uh, dietary recommendations, those diseases also reverse as well. Mm. Look, looking at this from your standpoint, how do we actually approach this problem? You know, there's a tsunami of chronic diseases and only a small sliver of people are actually seeing it and acting upon the information that is, is actually still to this day, like getting discredited in a lot of ways by these big institutions. So like, yeah. you know, you yourself, a, a small handful of other MDs are really fighting the good fight, but like, what else, what else can we do out there to, to make this message a little bit louder and a little bit uh, more well-received? Cause there's a lot of unhealthy people who are hearing it and just not doing anything about it. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's just really important to get, to get, you know, the message out there and, you know, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's difficult when it's not mainstream and you can't make those arguments in, in mainstream channels, but it, it's getting there. It's starting to make more moves. And, you know, you just like, you know, we, we met and spoke at, uh, at the KetoCon uh, convention, you know, and keto has been around for a while and people have had a lot of very good results with that. Well, now they're incorporating, you know, carnivore people like myself and Sean Baker and you know, um, Judy Cho and many, many others uh, who, who are advocating a carnivore diet and, and there, you know, we had a carnivore panel where, you know, you know, several of us uh, went up there, uh, you know, Dr. Kevin Stock, you know, Ada Fox and, you know, Lauren Espath, like, you know, and, uh, as long as well as uh, Baker and, and Judy, you know, and, and you know, a lot of people came to that and were asking questions and getting more curious about it. And, you know, uh, that I think is, is very important uh, in podcasts like this, getting the message out, but also just people word of mouth talking to their friends and their family and saying, Hey, you know, mom, you've been struggling with rheumatoid arthritis your whole life. Hey, I came across this. This is really interesting. These guys are saying that people have been, you know, curing and treating rheumatoid arthritis since 1800s by putting people on a carnivore diet. And oh, look, you know, Michaela Peterson, she completely reversed her rheumatoid arthritis after having two major joint replacements at the age of 16. Now she has no issues. She has no flare ups. Yeah. You know, she's not on medication. She's having kids, you know, so those are very powerful messages and just, you know, getting the word of mouth out there and, and, you know, you know, not, you know, being like a nosy neighbor and like getting in other people's business, but, you know, at, at, at least opening that door to that and just at least telling me, Hey, did you know, you know, this, this can really help you look at this, you know, check this out. Look at this dude's video. Look at this, uh, you know, podcast or something like that. Um, 
that's how it's going to have to be. It's uh, until we get enough traction to then, you know, get people like myself and Dr. Baker, you know, on, on live debates on television and, you know, where we get like, you know, uh, you know, uh, um, audience of, of millions out there and we can just, you know, go after these guys and go after these points. We've already started doing that. You know, I was involved in a carnivore versus vegan debate with, uh, you know, there were six doctors, you know, three on each team, you know, we just, we just made our case and that was for, you know, an Australian, um, uh, nutritional, uh, you know, it's the Australian college of nutritional environmental medicine. Um, and, you know, and they're doing a lot of work in that space and there are other organizations that are, that are moving that mark as well. So, uh, at this point, the best thing that people can do is keep doing podcasts like this, keep doing interviews like this and, and keep talking to people and individually, I, I've spoken to literally thousands and thousands of people one-on-one -on -one over the, over the last, you know, sort of five years. And I try to give them resources. I have, you know, I have a ton of studies and uh, resources on my phone and I talk to the people about it and I'll just send it to them right mm -hmm. there. And so I, Hey, look it up, take a look at yourself, you know, see what you think and, you know, patients and, and just friends and just people like, and I, you know, have a lot of time for these sorts of conversations with people because I think it's really, really important. And, um, you know, and so that's what everyone should be doing. If everyone starts doing this and they really, really get a handle on the information, they really get a handle on the arguments and the data, and then they go out and have these conversations with people that will grow. You know, Perth, Australia was like a vegan nightmare when I got there. And now I, I have, there are a lot of people that already know about the carnivore diet and, and know someone who's doing it. No one knew about this before I got there. And I'm not saying I'm the only one who influenced that, but I was talking to like three people a day about it for three years, mm -hmm. you know? And so like minimal. And so, and then those people talk to people and they're having amazing results and they talk to more people. And so the best thing we can do now is just really pushing this by word of mouth and, and directed. Like if you see a video you like, and you're like, Oh, actually I have a cousin or I have a friend who, you know, this would actually apply to send them that, mm -hmm. you know, you know, it, it's helpful to, the people putting out the videos because they get more traction and, and that can help their viewership and, and it will just be suggested to more people, which can also help, but it's really helpful to those people and just like making sure that they get that information is I think the best thing we can do at the moment. Yeah, that's why we feel like documentaries are such a great tool to get the word out there to our video clips. Like it's very tough to probably get someone that's not super into nutrition to read The Big Fat Surprise, which is like a 500 page book, so much good info. But it's like I can probably get someone to watch Sacred Cow, which is like an hour and, you know, that's the right nutrition on meat consumption. So, such a good documentary. Um, yeah. Definitely feel you on that point. Are there any are there any documentaries or books that you just recommend for people that want to dig into this a little bit more that are just like, very digestible and get right to the point. Yeah, I know that, that's a very good point. I think, I think we start like documentaries just carry a huge amount of weight. Like I mean, people mm -hmm. really pay attention to those things. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, um, you know, they, you know, things like, uh, you know, what the health, which is just the worst <laughs> thing ever made. And, um, and, uh, you know, game changers. I mean, these things have done a lot of harm and, um, you know, so we need to get those on our side as well, hundred percent. And I think that's a very good point is like getting out into the media. Like, you know, people can, people can affect this in their own world by just talking to people, but yeah, you're right. At a certain point, we really need to make this go mainstream. We need to get documentaries. We need to get television shows. We need, we need to get this as a major part of the conversation and people can see this is changing lives. Um, well, ones I really like would be uh, like Vinny uh, Tortorich's um, Fat A Documentary. He did two yeah. of those, was Fat A Documentary 1, and then there's the second one, Fat A Documentary 2. And then he just came out with Beyond Impossible, going into the whole you know industry side of things uh, with, with Beyond Meat and, uh, and, and just showing you know just, just what a farce this is. And he has a lot of very good people like Nina Teicholz and uh, uh, Gary Taubes mm -hmm. uh, who've been fighting this fight for decades now and they're so knowledgeable and they're so well read and they've you know written books of their own that are that are you know you know cardinal uh literature in this in this topic but they're very like like you say very digestible very easy to watch and it's just like you just you see this one like jesus okay <laughs> that's nuts and it's like but this is hard facts in history you know 
And um, so I think those are, those are um, his uh, documentaries are excellent. And, um, you know, but there, there are others. Uh, I haven't seen Magic Pill, but I've heard good things about it. I don't know if you guys have seen that one as well. That's, it's yeah. awesome. It's free on YouTube, yeah. too, which is great. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, yeah, these sorts of things. And um, there's a new TV show called Reversed um, that, you know, I've just put up on my, on my uh, Instagram, uh, you know, stories and things like that. Uh, they have like the Bloom Network and they're, and they're posting this thing called Reversed. Um, it's like, uh, you know, Bob Marley's nephew has, has produced this and his mom was having a lot of health issues. And he was like looking around and seeing things that could help. And he, you know, in his sort of interest in, in health and nutrition, he came across keto and how this was helping. And he did a, an episode or sorry, a season where he took a, you know, a bunch of people like, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Ken Berry, you know, took them down with a lot of people who were very, very sick, had diabetes uh, and very poorly controlled diabetes. And got them on like a ketogenic diet, high fat meat based diet in ketosis. And these people were just reversing these diseases, reversing their diabetes. One lady came on who was on an insulin pump for like 11 or 12 years is now off, you know, mm -hmm. does not need insulin anymore. That's unheard of. You know, that, that, that heretofore had just doesn't happen. You know, now it's happening every time someone goes onto a carnivore diet or even a ketogenic diet, you know, we have, we have studies looking at this too, you know, looking at fasting, they say in animal models, if you fast for a minimum of four days a month, you know, you'll reverse not only type two diabetes, but type one diabetes. They started, they showed that they could regrow their beta islet cells and start making insulin again. Wow. Okay. And so they said, well, you know, fasting is really hard for people. So that's not really fun. So what about a fasting mimicking diet? This mimics fasting. Well, that's a ketogenic diet, right? Yeah. That gets you into that metabolism, which is not a fasting metabolism, by the way. That's our primary metabolic state. That's why we get so much benefit from fasting and being in ketosis is because we're supposed to be in this metabolic state anyway. And when you get out of that metabolic state, things go to hell. And so that's part of the disease process. That's part of the poisoning is by screwing with your metabolism. And, and it, it goes down to your cellular metabolism too. It screws with your mitochondria that can't you know, process and make energy as well. It, it precipitates cancer. It feeds cancer. Cancers get feed on 400 times the amount of glucose that, that normal cells do, but they can't feed on ketones. Mm -hmm. So you go into ketosis, all of a sudden your cancer cells are getting starved out and you can actually, you know, have a, have a hack at it. So they did a show called reverse and they had these amazing, amazing results. Well, they're now doing a season two, um, in Costa Rica, where they're actually going for a carnivore diet and, you know, uh, myself and, you know, Dr. Barry and, um, you know, um, Bella steak and butter gal and others are going to be on that as well. You know, a lot of carnivore, uh, proponents and, and just really go for the gold is like, okay, you know, let's really try to hit some, some, some big problems here with, you know, what, what is, what we argue is the best modality from a diet point of view in any case. So it's great that these things are starting to get traction. It's great. These things are people are actually going to are starting to put money in and say, Hey, you know, let's, let's, let's put a production up here. So, um, I'm really excited for that. And I'm really excited for, uh, you know, more and more documentaries to come out as well. Where, where does your mind go when you see some of these documentaries come out like Game Changers and kind of the other side of the aisle where they're pushing this, this vegan movement? Um, and maybe even an extension of that, like when you hear like Vegan Fridays and things like that, or Meatless mm -hmm. Mondays, like th those types of things just run directly in line with what you're talking about. So I'm, I imagine you yeah. probably take a pretty strong stance against those. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, I've, I've always been of the, of the opinion that you should always look at, at the other argument because, you know, Hey, maybe I'm missing something, you know, and if these guys have a good argument, then I, you know, I want to hear it. Um, but they don't. And like, unfortunately, like, you know, for me, I have to, I have to keep watching these things because it's like, okay, you know, is there anything new here? No, there's nothing new. It's all garbage. Yeah. And, um, what the health was, was one of those. And it, it just pissed me off to watch this thing. I had a friend of mine who makes documentaries and is a really great person. And, and, um, you know, someone I, I really respect when I was coming out, you know, doing my research saying, Hey, look, this, this is making, this is a huge difference. And, and, um, uh, this is really interesting. You know, she was saying like, oh, you know, this game chair, the, well, not game changers, but uh, this what the health document just came out. Oh, it'll really change your mind. It, it has all this stuff. Like, you know, you should, you should watch this. This is really making waves. And she was saying this from a documentarian point of view because it was, it was very, very popular and successful. But from, you know, a scientific point of view and a medical point of view, it was complete and utter garbage. And I remember watching this. I got, I got, I think like 
a minute and a half into this and I was just already screaming at the television, you know, and like, <laughs> and, um, and so I started, I take, I started taking notes in my phone, like voice to text. And I, I stopped the, the video to watch you know, that I was watching. And I would just like basically scream in my phone, like all the things I had wrong with this. I'm like, well, this is bullshit. And here's why, and here's a link. And like, I would actually have like links to like showing that this was garbage. It took me four hours to watch the first hour of that horrible documentary because I kept stopping it and kept, you know, making notes. Um, I, I, I got like an hour into it and they started going to, you know, how, you know, just, just cows are evil and destroy everything. And I was just like, okay, I'm, I'm done with this nonsense. Like I've, I've, you know, I've watched enough of this to know that it's garbage. Like the rest of it's going to be garbage too. I don't need to waste my time. And I sent this whole thing. It was, it was so many pages. <laughs> I sent this to, to her. I mean, like you made me watch that horrible documentary. Like now you have to read my responses to it. And, um, uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's propaganda. You know, it's, it's plain and simple propaganda and, you know, they know that it is, you know, they, they, they purposefully and intentionally, um, you know, try to mislead people. A good example of that and what the health was when they had, um, you know, this, this very, you know, graphic scene of like, you know, mother with like a, you know, a tray of like dirty old cigarette butts and just like scooping them in and pouring them onto a child's uh, plate and saying that, feeding your kid processed meat was the same as feeding your kid cigarettes. And the justification for that, uh, that, that completely abhorrent comment was, you know, the fact that, that they showed this, this picture of, um, of, uh, you know, processed meat and uh, cigarettes and plutonium, they were all class one carcinogens, right. Or class A carcinogens, whatever. And they had a little number next to it that they put up there so they could say, oh, well, we put the number there. You know, we weren't trying to mislead you, but they don't tell you what that number is. That number was your, basically your relative risk of developing cancer with exposure and like how, how carcinogenic is this? So next to the processed meat was the number six. And next to the uh, cigarettes was 318,000. Wow. Okay, not the same, yeah. you know, and next to the plutonium was 8.6 million. Right. So this is stupid, you know, and they, and they know damn well that it's stupid, but they're trying to say, Oh, this is like feeding your kid cigarettes. Like, well, no, yeah. feeding your kid 30,000 servings of, of uh, processed meat may be equivalent to one cigarette, not the same damn thing as pouring a bunch of cigarette butts on your kid's plate. I mean, so this is, this is bullshit. And uh game changers was no different. That was just nonsense. You know, they, you know, you, you eat something, you eat a vegan burrito and you eat a, you know, a, a whatever, a meat burrito and they take your blood and spin it. And they're like, Oh, this one's so gross. Like based on what, what objective measure is that it looks less pleasing to you because you said so what the hell does that mean? Yeah. You are like, Oh my God, did you see it? The blood? Oh yeah. What? That's not a thing. You know, we don't, we don't spin people's bloods and look at it and go, Oh God, this, this looks different. I mean, like that's just retarded. Yeah. You know, when you eat fat, your body's going to absorb that in the form of chylomicrons and that will have a fat layer funny enough because your body is mobilizing fat. And so who told you that that wouldn't happen? Who thought that that was a bad thing? I mean, this is, this is stupid. And, and there's so many other, other problems as well. You know, like the guy, the world's strongest man or something like that. And, you know, it was this oh, yeah. weightlifter guy. The only competitions he'd ever won were vegan powerlifting competitions. Yeah. That wasn't even on the radar for like world's strongest man sort of stuff. I mean, like no one even knew who the hell he was, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it's just, it's just, you know, lies and nonsense. And a lot of, there were actually a number of athletes that they asked to get on the game changers documentary uh, originally as well. And so they're like, oh, okay, yeah, we'll go game changer. And they started going vegan and their performances dropped and they and they were getting injuries and they're like, screw this, you know? So they, they dropped out of the, of the project because it sucked, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, and they, and they don't tell you this either. They, you know, when, when you're, they, they presented this as if it was, it was a scientific, you know, study and, and discussion of, of scientific data and literature. Whenever you're presenting your own research or you're doing a presentation, you have to, you know, disclose your, um, uh, your, your, your influences and, uh, and, and any sort of, uh, you know, bias that you may have. Right. <clears throat> and so if you have a financial interest 
in something like you have to say that, you know, right. if I work for, if I work for, you know, the beef industry and I'm getting paid, you know, by, you know, some sort of industry in that moment, I need to say that like, Hey, I, I work for these guys just so you know, but the reason I work for these guys, is because I, you know, I believe it. Right. And here's the evidence. You can say that and that's fine. They didn't say any of that. And uh, you know, James Cameron, who is like, you know, the executive producer of this thing, you know, what they don't tell you is that he actually owns like something like $140 million worth of a pea protein company. Yes. You know, so this is just one giant commercial and propaganda hit piece to get people to start buying his product. You know, like, well, you we can't eat meat. Ooh, meat's so bad, but you sure need protein. So conveniently, I got some right here, you know, right. with a 10% discount code. Game changer. <laughs> I, I think it's the country's largest pea protein company too. I think it's a massive operation. Is that, yeah. I mean, yeah. it makes sense. I mean, like $140 million. I mean, that's going to be a big, you know, big, uh, big organization. And, that, and that's just his stake, you know? So yeah, this is, this is just nonsense. And you know, it was unfortunate that, you know, people like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, I mean, I mean, they're all buddies. Like, I mean, he's, he's known James Cameron since the seventies, man. I mean, he, you know, he did Terminator with the guy, but you know, it's, it's pretty sad that he would, you do that to people because I mean, this harms people. You're not just selling a product. This isn't just like glitz and glamor of Hollywood. You just say whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Uh, it does matter. I mean, this, this is people's health, you know, and people believe, you know, the, these people. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger was nearly carnivore when he was doing Mr. Olympia. Right. His body idol was Serge Nubre, mm. who would eat six pounds of horse meat a day. All the, all the old school bodybuilders were on a steak and eggs diet. Yes. Maybe some of them like Yoranda would have, is it him? Anyway, would have like a one sheet day a week where they load up on carbs. Um, and that's it. You know, the rest of the week, it was just steak and eggs, steak and eggs, steak and eggs. And Nubre was certainly of that mind. And so was Arnold because he, he looked at these guys. How do I, these guys are the top. How do I get to the top? And so that was the model that he picked. And now he's, now he's saying that, Oh, if only I was vegan, it would have been even better. I'm like get out. You know? Yeah. And, um, you know, he, he's a classic one for, for bullshitting anyway. You know, he even said in like his, um, you know, pumping iron that like when he, when people are upcoming, like, you know, Hey, can I get some tips? Can I get some advice? Like he would sabotage them on purpose. He would tell them the wrong things in order mm -hmm. to make them fail so that he had less competition, which is like, I've never, I've never been of the opinion that, you know, if you can only win by cheating, then like you haven't really won, you know, if you, if you can't beat someone man on man, then you really ain't shit. And like, that's sort of how I feel about him at this point. And, you know, and so you know, he's, he's saying that, you know, you have to, you know, it's like some people are saying that like, oh yeah, when you're, when you're doing the different, different um, flexes, you have to like make a different sound and a different grunt with each one. Like, oh, oh, you know, you like different, like crazy noises. And like, so then this guy would go with a competition, you do that. And they actually disqualified me like, get out of here. You're like, you're, you're just embarrassing yourself, you know? So he, he's, he's known for doing that, you know? And so I don't think this is anything else. I don't think this is something that he legitimately believes in. I don't think for a second, that he actually, you know, is buying what he's, he's selling here. Yeah. yeah. I know that um, there's a really good snippet where Dorian Yates gets interviewed on his opinion of Schwarzenegger. And I think he just like, kind of like quibbly responds. He's like, well, he's boys with the Rothschilds and the elites like that. And that's pretty much all I'm going to say about that. So <laughs> I think that pretty much tells you everything you need to know. But to your point, it's like, you look up the diets of these golden era bodybuilders that have the best physiques of all time steaks cottage cheese eggs like you mentioned i think geronda was eating like 30 eggs a day or something mm. ridiculous. like raw dairy i think tom platz was like i think tom platz would have a bunch of desiccated liver capsules so they're basically all animal based to your point yeah. so now tell people that they shouldn't be eating these things and they can still get big and strong it's just complete bullshit yeah, absolutely. You know, and, uh, you know, like all, all the studies show that as well, you know, I mean, like, you know, you, you need a certain amount of protein, but you need bioavailable protein. You actually need fat and cholesterol as well. There's, there's this the good study that came out recently that showed that without dietary intake of cholesterol, it, it really curtails your, your, um, uh, muscle generation and muscle, yeah, muscle generation. Um, and building and, uh, you know, people with like MS, uh, as well, like if you're not taking in, exogenous, uh, cholesterol, you're not going to be remyelinating your, your, uh, cells, right. You need that mm -hmm. cholesterol. Um, and then for, uh, you know, you know, plant proteins and things like that, these are not bioavailable, you know, bioavailability obviously, you know, is, is very important because, you know, if you have, you know, if you have a, a box that says, you know, 30 grams per scoop 
of you know protein per you know scoop of, of pea extract yeah. um you know how much of that are you actually absorbing like we assume 30 is going to be in my body and making muscles that's wrong that's dead wrong mm -hmm. you know most of these things are, are not bioavailable they are not uh, in a form that our body can break down properly because we aren't supposed to break these things down, you mm. know? So we have some enzymes that, that, that sort of work and can kind of break these things down and then pop off some amino acids, but we're not breaking these things down fully. And we have plenty of studies showing that, that, you know, in the feces and even the, um, you know, the, the material that comes out of uh, people's like stoma bags, you know, when you eat pea protein, almost all of it's coming out. Mm -hmm. When you eat animal-based protein, almost none of it comes out right? Unless you're eating fiber, fiber will again, you know, slow that. But if you're not eating fiber, like almost none of this, none, none of this will come out. If any will come out. Mm. So, and, and there's other things too, you know, and, you know, plants have defense chemicals that do a lot of different things. One of those things block the, the absorption fiber or block um, the, or inhibit the enzymes that break down proteins and fat. So there's, there's like protease inhibitors and in soy and wheat uh, are two good examples. And these will stop your pancreas's enzymes from being able to break down uh, fat and protein. Mm -hmm. So even if you're eating animal-based protein, but you're eating that in a sandwich form and you're getting some wheat in there, that's going to block the protease. And that's not going to be able to break down even your animal-based protein. You're not going to be able to absorb as much of that. And so this screws with your body. And, you know, so... You know, there, there's a lot that goes into this and, um, you know, all of it's bad. Really. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. Dr. Chafee, one of the things you mentioned, um, we talked, we touched on some of the documentaries that are basically propaganda. And then we touched on some of the documentaries that do a really good job. We mentioned sacred cow. One of the things that we loved about sacred cow is how Rob Wolf and Diana Rogers, they kind of go out on a limb and say, look, we wish we could say that grass fed, grass fed, grass finished meat is nutritionally better for you than grain fed meat. But the, our new, our data just shows that that's not the case. Based on some of the research that you've done, do you find that to be similar? Just like curious how you think about those yeah. things. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that that you know um, that the data certainly doesn't doesn't really show a big difference mm -hmm. in, in grain uh, finish versus like grass fed. I mean, you look at you look at just the, the simple relationship of the of the different macros and micros that are in there. They are different, you know. And so you know, if you have um, if you've been grain feeding a cow for over three months studies show that they basically have no omega-3 fatty acids left it's they're all omega-6s i mean so that's the difference right mm -hmm. and now does that make an objective difference to such a degree that you can it, this can be demonstrably and objectively measured you know so far no you know but it, you know it probably is you know it's like it's um you know if the animal's as healthy as it can be if it's eating what it's supposed to eat you know, it's just going to have a, a slightly better complement of, of nutrients and nutrition. It's going to be healthier. It's going to be healthier for you to eat, but you know, it's, it's at least small enough of a difference as to really be immaterial. Like I, I almost exclusively eat grain finished mm. beef. Mm. You know, I, I do feel better on, on grass finished, grass fed and finished, but that, you know, that's a bit of a difficulty too, because a lot of things are said that they're hundred percent grass fed and, and they're really not. And, you know, a good way of looking at that is like, what color is the fat? If the fat's not yellow, well, it didn't end its life eating grass. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was put on something else that, that sort of sapped those nutrients, you know, that, that yellowness comes from beta carotene and, you know, if that's not in there, well, then, you know, you're, you're missing out on at least that nutrient. Um, it's, you know, the way I sort of think about it is, you know, uh, like grass fed beef is like gold medal at the Olympics and grain, grain finished is like second place, you know, mm -hmm. grain finished still means that 80% of its life was, was eating grass. You know, it's just the last couple of months they were, they were eating grains. So still mostly fine, you know, silver lost to gold, right. But silver still beat everyone else on earth. Yeah. So, you know, whether or not your, um, you know, you're worried about things, the difference between grain fed and grass fed, you know, you still shouldn't eat anything else, you know, like there's still going to be nothing else that's better than that. Um, and I'm sure there are differences. I, I just, I really don't doubt that, but I don't think that those differences are significant in the sense of, of detracting from your health to a degree of causing disease or really impacting your life. Mm. Dr. Chapey, what would be your most actionable advice for people who are going from a standard American diet, interested in carnivore, but maybe just like haven't 
they don't have that like on off switch like the three of us mm -hmm. have where we can just like you know put it into hyperdrive what would what sort of things would you tell them to start making that bridge over to a, a more animal based carnivore lifestyle yeah um yeah i mean i you know i i do like the sort of the the cold turkey approach and just if you make that decision you just be like hard like right now this stops and you just you literally just throw all the crap out of your out of your house and you just throw it out and you just go to meat because you know it's out of sight out of mind you know if it's there it's going to be a, a you know a you know a bit of a distraction it's going to be a temptation you know i mean i don't i don't think anyone is 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 advising people to buy a carton of cigarettes and then try and quit smoking with right. that cigarette pack, you know, carton of cigarettes on their shelf, like throw them away, you know, yeah. get them out of the house. Um, but if that's, you know, uh, not something that, that people can do, uh, I always recommend, you know, having a plan, you know, just sort of trying to get a timeline because if you're, you're like, oh, I'm quitting smoking and you know, people can quit smoking for 20 years and be smoking more cigarettes at the end of that than at the beginning. Uh, you need a clear timeline, you know, say, okay, so this week I'm eating this next week, I'm eating less of that next week. I'm not eating it at all. And, and you go on from there, um, eating more meat, eating fatty meat, you know, that should just be the basis of your meal, any meal. And, uh, that if you're eating more meat, that's going to displace the other things anyway, then it's a matter of just eliminating things, these things out. I would hundred percent start, you know, on a keto diet, right? A whole foods, keto diet get rid of sugar, get rid of carbohydrates and alcohol, and you just get rid of it. I would start there. That's a, that's the first and foremost thing that I would get out of, out of their diet. After that would be things like nightshades, potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, you know, all capsicums, all, you know, bell peppers and, and, pepper and everything like that. Um, those, those are worse than other vegetables, you know, and, uh, and then you just sort of taper it down from there. And, you know, at that point you're mostly eating, fatty meat and salads, you know, and then you can just sort of, you know, uh, taper it down from there. I mean, I've never really enjoyed a salad anyway. I don't know like, if I, I've never really eaten a salad. I didn't feel compelled to eat yeah. and, um, you know, and just, and just see how you go, but have a timeline, just be like, okay, dropping carbs day one and eating a lot more meat. Great. You do that for like a couple of weeks. Then I'm, you know, I'm going to drop, you know, nightshades and I'm going to drop this or I'm going to drop that, or, or maybe just wean it down less and less if they want to, you know, if you really want to go on a carnivore diet, I think it's, it's good to just go and go for it and mm -hmm. just see how great you feel because you will feel absolutely amazing. And after about two weeks, all the crap will get out of your system. If you're just eating meat and water and you will literally feel like a different breed of human. And like, I don't know anyone who has sort of experienced that and, and not wanted to continue that. Now there are people that really miss the variety of food and for whatever reasons. And I think you have to sort of, you know, come at this uh, individually and think about you know, what are your motivations? Why do you want to do this for me? I just don't want to eat poison. And I know plants are poisonous. So I'm just not, I'm not touching that crap. Yeah. Um, other people, maybe they want to build muscle. Maybe they want to be a better athlete. Maybe they, you know, want to lose weight, but you know, you have to keep your, your eye on the prize, you know, whatever reason you want to do a uh, carnivore for you know, be mindful of that. And like, oh, I couldn't have pizza. And oh, I don't have this variety. Who gives a shit? Like you are getting all these amazing benefits, you know, by doing this, like that so far overshadows the, um, the, the, you know, not having, being able to have, you know, pizza and ice cream Sunday. Like, I mean, who cares? Like I, I like pizza. I like ice cream. Mm -hmm. I like feeling like a superhero way more. Way more. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's honestly a really good mental model of just drawing a line in the sand because it's like, you're going to the inner eye of the grocery store. You're like, Oh, this stuff tastes really good. But mm -hmm. what you're saying is like, dude, that's literally a product. That's not real food. So it's like, even mm -hmm. though it tastes good, it's literally going to detract from your health. It's effectively going to poison you. So what you can't, you're saying, Hey, these foods, maybe it's red meat, eggs, water, bone broth, whatever. Those are the foods that you're sticking to that are going to make you feel the best that you've ever felt in your life. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and that's the thing, you know, for, for me, you know, food is nutrition, food is, is supposed to, you know, help my body stay healthy and work properly so that I can go out and do cool things. You know, a lot of people, you know, use food as, as entertainment, just similar as what we would use drugs and alcohol and cigarettes. I mean, like I enjoy doing this. And so I want to do this, even though it may hurt me. And, and we, we've, we've had that model for a long time. You're like, Oh, I'm going to have some ice cream. Oh, I know it shouldn't, but Oh, you know, whatever. This is, um, this is the same relationship that we, we have with drugs, you know, or alcohol, like, yeah, drinking is bad for me, you know, but you know, it's Friday night, whatever, fine, you know, in, enjoy your life. If that's what you want to do, but you know, don't kid yourself, you know, I mean, th this stuff 
this stuff harms you. And so for me, I just really like feeling my best. And I, I want, I want to put fuel in my body so I can go out and do cool things. Like I don't, I don't need to eat food as entertainment. You know, I've, I've never been that interested, you know, it's not like, um, you know, I, I just need to entertain myself that way. But there are a lot of people who go to breakfast, go to lunch, go to dinner, go to brunch, go to coffee, go to drinks, do all these things. Their entire social life is mm. surrounded, uh, you know, surrounds food. And, you know, I'm just so glad I'm out that uh, outside of that. I'm, I'm just on, I'm on the outside looking in going like, yeah, you know, good luck with that. I go out and do things. I eat once a day. I feel amazing. I'm not hungry for another 24 hours. And I go out and, and do things, you know, and I go out and I go on hiking, I go work out, I, you know, I work, you know, 120 hours a week, you know, I'm, I do my podcast, I do, I see friends, I see family, and I just have tons of energy and tons of life. And I can actually go out and do things with people. And I enjoy that so much better than, than just sitting around and just eating random crap, you know, and I remember like, you know, talking to people, um, you know, especially like in, in the dating scene before I was, I was, um, uh, seeing my girlfriend, you know, you talk to people like, Oh, you know, what are you into? What do you like to do? And like, I can't even tell you how many girls would be like, Oh, I like going to, you know, new restaurants and like trying things. I'm like, that's a hobby. You know, like, <laughs> that's like, that's like your pastime is just going to restaurants. I'm like, Jesus Christ, you know, like your life sucks, but like, um, you know, but, but that's the thing we're, we're all stuck in that. I was stuck in that. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And, and we don't realize it now I can be on the outside, look at that going like, Ugh. but at the time it was just like, Oh, this is cool. Let's try this. You, you don't see it when you're inside of it, yeah. you know, yeah. but you know, now that I'm out of it, I'm just, I'm so happy. Yeah. And speaking of vices, I'm going to be honest. I grabbed you a keto con. I said, Dr. Chafee, give me your thoughts on coffee. It's my yeah. last vice that I haven't picked yet. And you, this story that convinced me that I need to get off of it. I think you had this awesome story about like this, some workout and hike that you did yeah. non-coffee versus when you incorporated coffee. Can you tell that story really quickly? Cause after that, I was like, all right, fuck it. I'm done. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, when, when I was just getting back into carnivore, so I, you know, I started carnivore, you know, 22 years ago, um, you know, just inadvertently just wasn't eating plants was on that for like five years. And then after that was mostly meat based, but, you know, sort of slipped some things back in. Then about five years ago, after I got back from doing humanitarian work in, in Bangladesh and the refugee camps there, I had rediscovered this and we're like, oh, Jesus, like I knew it. I knew plants were trying to kill me, like screw these things. And I just got rid of them. And, um, and so I'd been carnivore again for about two weeks. I was feeling amazing, maybe two, three weeks, just absolutely felt outstanding. And I was, um, I was working out. I had sort of like a home gym set up and I was just, you know, just lifting heavy, you know, every day I lost like 25 pounds or sorry, 23 pounds in two weeks. And then like my, my weight remained stable. And I just, my, then my body was just transforming after that, but I stayed the same weight. And I noticed that I wasn't really getting sore after working out. I thought that was really strange. And I, and I did like a, like a heavy leg circuit, um, where I did like 12 heavy sets of legs and, you know, like one legged weighted, you know, box steps and all, all these sorts of things that like normally would kick my ass. And I did like 12 sets of these things to failure. I always go to failure. Like every, every, every set, like I, I'm doing reps until like I physically can't do them anymore. And that's just how, that's how you get results. And, um, and so I was doing that and like, you know, I wasn't sore the next day. I'm like, well, that's weird because normally I judge like how hard I'm working and how good my workouts are by how sore I am the next few days. And like my whole life, I'm having different body groups sore on alternate days. I kind of like that. I'm like, yeah, this is great. I'm, I'm really you know, working hard here. All of a sudden I have none of that. And I remember thinking like, you know, I was like, all right, you know, I, I wasn't, you know, like jello legged and like, just like wobbling out of there at the end of this, you know, so maybe I just, you know, I'm not working out as hard or, or, you know, like what's going on. So I decided that my next leg day, a few days later, I would just really go after it. So I do this, I did the same, you know, heavy, you know, 12 sets. And then I just decided to do um, squats after that. <clears throat> and I just decided to do as many sets of squats um, as necessary to wear out my legs. And I was just, I just did set after set, after set, after set, after set, after set, after set. And I was listening to, you know, my favorite uh, author, Thomas Sowell. And so I was just listening to his book on tape and I was just listening to his stuff and like, you know, just enjoying that and just doing all these sets. And I was giving myself a, a proper break. I, you know, I give myself a full recovery, you know, like, like, you know, even like four minutes. And, and when I was ready to go, I go. And 
as long as I gave myself, you know, a proper rest, I could just keep going. And I just did so many sets and I eventually like looked at it and, and I did an, another 20 sets of, of squats. Right. So I did 32 squats sets of, of heavy legs. And like, I just, I just sort of dawned on me, like I can keep doing this the rest of the night. Like I, I just, this is nothing, you know, as long as I'm giving myself a rest, I am not, I'm not saying I've been doing some, some things now where I basically don't give myself any rest, like, you know, 30 seconds rest for upper body, uh, 60 mm -hmm. seconds rest for lower body. And then I can burn myself out. And that's what Nubre did. And that's what Karanda did as well. And they do like 12 sets of 12 or eight sets of eight, uh, respectively. And, um, so as long as I gave myself enough rest, I could not wear out my legs. And, you know, then I was there and I was just like, you know, so, so for instance, the first set of the 20, I did 15 squats to failure. My last set was 13, you know, so at the same, at the same weight. And so I was just like, all right, well, I could literally keep doing this the whole night, but like, I've been here for four hours and I've got shit to do. So <laughs> I'm just going to cut this now. And, um, and I had uh, a friend of mine, like, message me you know because i was actually pretty worried because like you know i'd done like that that 12 uh set leg thing like i'd done that leg circuit with like a lineman from like the uw football team uh back in the day and that was how, how where i learned that leg leg workout and that was like at the end of the season of the rugby season where i like my legs were beasts at the time like you know because i was so much sprinting so much running like my, my legs were just tree trunks and i did this sort of big circuit with them and like i literally couldn't walk for two damn weeks. I was, in, I was just in agony for two solid weeks. And so I was looking at this, I'm like, Jesus, okay. I really don't want to do that. Again. I never want to experience that again. And this is, and this, I did three times that, that sort of workout. And so I was just kind of nervous. I'm like, Jesus Christ, like, I'm just going to be crippled. A friend of mine texted me and said, Hey, you know, do you want to go hiking up this, this horrible mountain tomorrow? This is a bitch. It's just switchbacks the entire way up. It's like three hours, just straight up. And, uh, and it's awful. And I was just like, and I was just thinking about that. I'm like, Jesus, you know, what if I, what if I've done this to myself again? And so I was just like, take back. I'm like, you know, let's just take it easy there. You know, I may have just done something very stupid and uh, I may not be walking for the next few weeks. So, um, you know, why don't we just see, you know, how things are going tomorrow and we'll make a decision. Next day I woke up, it was like nothing had happened. Like I hadn't even worked out. I, I felt my, my hamstrings were, you know, fine. Everything was fine. And I started going up the stairs. It was like, it was like nothing happened. And then I started taking like steps two at a time and I could feel my hamstrings like, oh, okay. Yeah. You know, you know, something happened, but you know, they don't hurt. They're not sore. I could do it again. Easy. You know? So I was like, all right, you know, let's go hiking, hiked up this horrible mountain, came back down, felt amazing. I'm like, right. It's, it's time to get back into rugby. Like I'm, I'm ready now. Whereas before that, you know, I wasn't feeling good. I wasn't feeling great. And, you know, and then, you know, I went carnivore and this is like two weeks later. I'm like, yeah, let's do this. I was still overweight. I still had a lot of extra excess fat, you know, and, um, I was probably like two, I know I was 243 at the time. I know because I was 243 every day for the next three months after that. And so mm -hmm. that's why I know that specifically. And I was just like, right, you know, I'm going to go back to rugby. Went to rugby that night, you know, with, uh, sea wolves um who is that you know the professional seattle team and that was the, the first year that was sort of uh um just when i got back i was in um i was in bangladesh during the preseason uh but now i was just getting back in when they're starting the season and uh and I, I went in all these guys were you know had been playing and training the whole time and uh i hadn't i'd been in i'd been in, in a you know a refugee camp and I was at a dead sprint the whole time. And I was just, I was right in there with it, with, with everyone, you know, just sprinting, tackling, just everything like that without problem. And afterwards I just felt amazing next day still wasn't sore. You know, then my hamstring was like, yeah, you've done a lot of work, you know, like you keep doing this, you're probably going to tear something, but it's still not sore. Still not, not like I couldn't do it again. Two days after, right. You get your, you know, normally your, your most sore 48 hours after a major workout, still no problem. I went out to uh, meet a friend and we went, we decided to go for coffee. And I was thinking to myself like, Oh, okay. You know, I haven't had coffee in a few weeks. Let's see how this affects me. You know, can I have coffee? What does this do to me? One cup of black coffee. And 20 minutes later, like literally I, I could feel my hamstrings and my back start to tighten up and get stiffer and stiffer and more painful and more painful. I was like looking down, well, what is happening? I was sore for the next two days after that from one cup of black coffee. So 
I know there are studies that, that say that, you know, coffee is good and provides benefit and so forth. And, it, you know, it might in certain respects, but I also know that it causes inflammation, you know, mm-hmm. because I felt it. And I also know that it has all these defense chemicals that, that other plants have typically, and typically find a higher concentration of this in the seeds. You know, a seed is a plant's baby and all organisms protect their, their babies more than anything by and large. And so, you know, this is where you generally find, you know, the most, the, the highest concentration of, of toxic defense chemicals. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I noticed right there, I was sore for two days, not, not close to what, you know, I would have been if I was eating a, a standard diet, but it was enough that I did not want that experience again. And so like, mm-hmm. for me, it was like, you know, hashtag not worth it. So like, I haven't really drank, drank coffee since then. Is inflammation really the thing that you're solving for when you're, you know, removing all these other things and just eating a carnivore diet? Is that what you're thinking about mostly? Yeah. I mean, you know, inflammation is a pretty general term that people use uh, interchangeably just with problems that we're causing in our body. Right. Um, But, you know, whether it elicits an an actual inflammatory response um, or is just damaging you in some way, you know, is, you know, it's, it's neither here nor there. I mean, it's causing, it's causing harm in your body, but there's a lot of people that, you know, attribute specifically inflammation to a lot of disease processes. Mm. And, um, and it certainly is the case that, you know, you derange your, your immune system, you know, you're going to have problems, autoimmune issues, certainly, um, but also pain. So, you know, when, when you have these defense chemicals, they increase inflammation, you're going to experience pain more and you're going to get stiff and sore and painful. And people have arthritis, they experience that uh, to a much higher degree. Uh, you know, Sean Baker, you know, when he, when he was in his orthopedic, uh, practice, you know, he was putting people on like a keto paleo diet and all of a sudden they were getting ready to do like a shoulder replacement or a knee replacement. And all of a sudden they come in a month later and they're like, doc, like, I don't need it. I'm not in pain. Wow. You know, I'm like, how is that possible? You got bone on bone arthritis in your knee. You shouldn't even be walking right now, you know, but you know, you don't experience the same amount of pain. I've had patients, a number of patients that have had, <clears throat> you know, compressed nerves, uh, you know, coming from their spine and they've had, you know, shooting horrible, you know, electric shock playing co- called uh, radiculopathy down their legs or, or arms. And, you know, you go on a carnivore diet or even a keto diet with, you know, low inflammatory, you know, like no nightshades or anything like that. Uh, this improves their, their condition significantly, you know, fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia is something that, you know, people really suffer from. But it's sort of a diagnosis of exclusion. And by a diagnosis of what a diagnosis of exclusion means is that you've, you've sort of exhausted all your, your, uh, your, your thoughts and like what this could be. We don't know what it is. So it's like, okay, it's this we'll call it fibromyalgia. It's not an actual diagnosis. It's, it's that we don't know what the hell is going on. We don't know why you're in pain. Uh, everything that we're looking at says that you probably shouldn't be in pain, but you're in pain. So we'll call it fibromyalgia. And a lot of doctors think that it's actually, you know, people making this stuff up or, or, you know, just, you know, maybe drug seeking or, you know, just, just, you know, not, uh, you know, need, need to like drink a cup of concrete or something like that and toughen up. But, um, but, you know, but there are people that I, I, I fully know, I know for a fact that this exists because I've, I've just, I've spoken to people about it and they're, you know, it affects their life and it affects how they live their life. So it was like, clearly something's happening. Further testimony to this is I've had a lot of patients with fibromyalgia that have gone on a carnivore diet, gone, wow. you know? So how do you cure something that doesn't exist? Right. And, um, you know, and if these guys are drug seeking and they just want, they just want attention and, uh, and some TLC, well, why, why would that help either? You know, because they're just going to, they're going to still want the TLC. They're going to still want the drugs, but they're saying, no, I'm off the drugs. Thank God. I hated taking those things. Mm -hmm. And now I don't need any of the painkillers. So, you know, that is a significant, um, uh, you know, benefit and reduction in, in, and demonstration of what what a reduction in in just inflammation can do as well. Mm, It's incredible. You know, despite all the anti-meat propaganda that exists right now, are you still confident in your ability and our ability to be able to share the proper narrative of red meat and get people to start thinking about nutritionally nutrition the right way? Yeah, no, I, I I really am. I I do think that this is, I, I do think that the truth will out and, um, you know, eventually this will, this will just be, 
too big to deny. And mm-hmm. I think we, I think we're getting to that point. We're sort of hitting critical mass. This is this is just about to explode. It's very exciting, mm-hmm. you know, because we have the documentaries, we have the TV shows, we have a lot of people writing books. I'm I'm writing. I need to get on the train and get <laughs> get my thing you out of there. You write a book, yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, and the more people writing books, the more people doing podcasts, the more people talking about this is just going to grow and grow. And it it is correct. It is backed by hard science, hard, demonstrable, objective uh, evidence. And so when people see this, more people see this and be like, this, what else can it be? Mm-hmm. You know, you have, you have vegans who have been like vegan influencers and like, oh, this is the best thing to do. And then they have so many health problems. They end up going carnivore and they're like, what was I ever doing? I'm so sorry to everyone. I, I you know, I, I said this to you, there's a number of these things and they're getting, they're getting more, uh, you know, more and more in number. So I think the truth will out. And I think, I think eventually this is just the cat's going to be out of the bag. And, you know, even though people are, are really trying to oppress this and they're really trying to suppress this down and they're really trying to vilify meat and vilify cows and say, they're destroying the environment. They're destroying our health. They're destroying the world. Uh, it is, absolute nonsense and it, it can be thoroughly uh you know you know thoroughly demonstrated that this is nonsense and so you know it's it's going to get out there eventually i think it's going to be a fight i think they're really ramping up their side of the of the of the fight and really you know pulling some very dirty tricks and in different countries actually just trying to ban and limit you know um uh, cattle and livestock you know in ireland they were talking about having uh, they were just going to kill 1.3 million cows because oh it's just climate change you know oh my god this, this impact on the environment cows help are part of the environment yes. animals are part of the environment you know they contribute to the environment they recycle nutrients and they replenish the nutrients in the soil it's actually really good it's a really good thing you know and so you know that's uh that's a very strange line to take and and i don't think they even believe it and there's 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 many examples of this you know in australia um i was speaking to uh um a rancher who was saying that they're trying to impose a thirty five hundred dollar methane tax on cattle thirty five hundred dollars is what they sell a year old steer for so basically they're making it you know cancel out like oh you want to raise that fine You're, you're going to make zero money on it you know, in fact, you're going to lose money on it because you will not be able to get anything for it. So it's, um, you know, it's a real nasty, that's nasty nuts. move. Yeah. That's nuts. The, yeah. It, are you writing about any of these environmental or regulatory topics at all? Or are you sticking mostly to the nutrition stuff? I'm, I'm curious. You yeah, know, I'm, I'm doing a chapter on, on the environment as well. There's a really good guy. I don't know if you guys had seen my, my interview with uh, Dr. Peter uh, Baylorstedt. Oh yeah. He's the best. Yeah. Oh, he's awesome. The yeah. sod father. Yeah, the, the sod father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The sod father of the Ruminati or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, he's awesome. And, and he's just a really good person too. I, I really like that guy. And, um, you know, he, he just, he just shows out just hard evidence, hard facts. You know, he's a, he, for people who don't know him, he's a PhD in forage agronomy he has a degree in animal nutrition and, and he's showing like this, these, these are hard facts, these are hard numbers, you know, and this is not something that gets, that gets thrown around um, uh, very readily. You know, human nutrition is a pretty poor uh, subject. It, it, it's just a poor discipline. It's a soft science. It is the mm-hmm. definition of a soft science. Um, animal-based nutrition is, is a hard science because you can actually do real controlled trials and studies in, in controlled environments. You can't do that with people. You can't take identical twins by the thousands and split them off into identical institutions with identical circumstances and then change one variable mm-hmm. and then f- study them for their the entire course of their life to, to see what's going on. It's not ethical. It's not practical. Uh, you can do that with a cow. You can do that with sheep. You can do that with goats. So we have really, really, really good science in that field. And, and he is a, a top scientist in that field. And so, you know, he, he does a lot of uh, very, very good work and put out a lot, puts out a lot of very, very good information. And then you have guys like uh, Alan Savory over in Zimbabwe, who for the last 50 years has been taking large groups of livestock and running them through deserts and turning those deserts into, you know, verdant fields mm-hmm. and forests, you know, that's because the animals, you know, contribute to the environment. People don't, get that 
you know, plants and animals have a symbiotic relationship. You can't have one without the other, yeah. you know, and it's very, very important to have animals in an area, you know, people think it's like, oh, you have too many animals in an area, then they just, you know, they just wipe out the vegetation. No, it's, it's the opposite. You know, the more animals you have, you know, that can be supported, obviously, the, the more vegetation there will be to support animals, you know, like in, in the, um, you know, the, the colonial days of, uh, of America, you know, there were buffalo in the hundreds of million going throughout the Great Plains. And they were not the only large animal. They were deer, you know, home, home on the range where the deer and the antelope play. Like I've never seen an antelope in the Midwest, but they, they were, you know? And so um, there were tons of these animals and all the, all the explorers that were going through, they were going through the mountains, which is normally where people go hunting now because that's where the animals are. Mm-hmm. And they were like, God, you know, get me out of these stupid mountains. I just can't wait to get into the plains where it's just like, you, you just, you just shoot in a random direction. You're going to hit an animal. You know, it was like a nature video on the Serengeti where it's just like herds of animals and just lions dotted around. It's just like, just, just teeming with life. Mm-hmm. That was the middle of America, you know? And, um, and the grass was so, uh, the, the soil was so rich. The grass was nine feet tall. There were explorer stories talking about how they, they could tie the grass in a knot over their horse's head, Wow! you know? So, you know, that those animals supported more more plants and when you got rid of the animals you know the plants went away too and that's what that's what uh savory found as well they actually you know the government of zimbabwe in the 70s killed something like thirty thousand elephants because they thought they were turning these areas into deserts and in fact the desert started forming faster because it was actually the the elephants were were stopping that you Mm -hmm. know and then they killed thirty thousand of them all of a sudden everything went to hell you know and so he actually was intelligent enough to realize that something was wrong there. And he looked into it and he now has been doing this for 40 years. He's written textbooks on the subject. Um, he's a very accomplished and bright guy and he's doing things that have demonstrable, repeatable results, right? So, you know, a, a theory is only as good as what it's able to predict. You know, uh, a study is only good as, as its repeatability. Like if you say, oh, hey, we did this, we got this result. It's like, okay, can you repeat it? And someone else in someone in another location repeats it again, like, mm, no, we're not getting the same results, right? They're getting the same results. They're doing this all over the world for at least 40 years, if not more. Yeah. And it's the same results every single time, you know? So that's, that's proof that this is, this is, uh, this is something. So yeah, I, I will definitely be, you know, commenting and writing on that as well. Yeah, that'll be great. Speak, yeah, speaking of results, just really quick, we have uh, Taylor and Katie Collins who founded Epic and Force of Nature Meets. They're coming on the podcast uh, this Friday, which we're excited about. Nice. They're huge advocates for the Savory Institute. And they mentioned oh, yeah. that when they bought Rome Ranch, all the leading experts were telling them it was going to take them at least 20 to 30 years to regenerate the land. Just by introducing their first pack of bison, they did. They mm-hmm. took 20 to 30 years and did it in like, I think four to five, they said, yeah. right? something crazy. Yeah. So that's like, awesome. there's the proof of work that you're talking about right there. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. No, oh, that's awesome. I, I didn't know that, but that, that's fantastic. And it's, it's so great that more people are getting into, you know, regenerative uh, farming and agriculture and taking these principles and applying them to their own, uh, to their own land, because it's, it's, it's going to benefit them commercially, but it will also just benefit the planet. And it's always great when you have, you know, industry that, you know, that something that benefits your industry also benefits every, every, everybody and every uh, thing else. So that's, that's always great. And that's, that's another reason why I think this is just, this is the right track to go down yeah. because, you know, by us doing this, this benefits everyone else, you know, and, uh, and we're, we're dropping, you know, we, we spend, you know, trillions of dollars a year on medical, medical expenditures. We also spend trillion over a trillion dollars a year on, on eating sugar, you know, and, you know, we, we, we could free up literally trillions of dollars every single year and put those into, you know, really practical and useful endeavors that would benefit all of humanity and not just spin our wheels, you know, poisoning ourselves and then taking the antidote, you know, that's Mm -hmm. not even a good antidote, you know, it's just sort of, you know, having us die slowly over 40 years. hundred percent. Yeah. That's, it seems like such a, the solution that's so upstream from everything else, like all these problems that are happening in society that, um, you know, hopefully we can all continue to shed light on these topics. And I think this conversation today, will just continue to, to, to do that for our audience and, and hopefully your audience as well. We'll just, you know, 
have, have some information here that they can take away and actually put to use. So, um, you know, Dr. Schaefer, we really appreciate, appreciate your time. Uh, we know it's valuable. So for you to come on, uh, it's a big deal for us. We really appreciate it. Hey, n not a problem at all. I was, I was happy to, it was really good talking to you guys and meeting you at QCon and, uh, yeah, we should do it again sometime. Maybe we'll do 32 squat, 32 sets together <laughs> next time. <laughs> do it, man. It'll work. Yeah. I'm down. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, man. This is great. No problem, man. Thank you. Appreciate it.